Hey everybody, today I am going to be reviewing Fargo. This film came out in 1996 and it is a collaboration between the legendary Coen brothers. Fargo is of course a classic film and it is one of the Coen brothers great staples as uh, artists, as filmmakers, and they've dabbled in all kinds of different classicist uh, genres and inverting some of those cliches to bring out a rawness and, um, you know, a quirks to it, a rural twang, putting these larger-than-life moral tales into uh, smaller settings and having an unlikely protagonist at the center. For me, this is like in my top three Coen Brothers movies, and you know, there's a handful of them that I absolutely adore, but this is really uh, one of them. I think it is honestly one of their absolute most balanced works, incorporating all of their strengths in a way that is just so perfect. It is on full display and almost perfectly constructed all the way through. Nothing here feels uneven, nothing feels like it's too much or too little. It is it is as perfect as it gets. The reason the Coens are so good at, at what they do is because they are very educated. They have really done their research and they're educated in all kinds of different genre staples and that is why they're able to invert them in such a way so it doesn't feel forced or exaggerated, they capture the details. And they never lose sight of the core themes and the humanity that is at the center in, in this film. Because it is a, a black comedy and it has many satirical elements in it and it can still somehow uh, embody all of that humor through a very twisted and disturbed sort of lens and yet still be incredibly uh, genuine. It always feels organic, very much like life. As a satire, it is trying to uh, explore and highlight a lot of the failures of society, the failures of humanity, and doing so through, you know, more dimension, through our quirks, through our eccentricities, and how often a lot of what we want and a lot of our weaknesses are getting in the way of our self-actualization in a way that seems so blatant from the outside. And yet when you're absorbed in it, it feels absolutely rational even though it's not. And I think that's something that they, they capture so beautifully. There is a richness to those ideas and a real richness to these characters. These characters are absolutely um, wonderful. And no matter how outrageous it may seem, the emotion at the center is always quite uh, intimate and simple. Seeing it this most recent time, and I hadn't seen it in uh, quite a few years uh, all the way through, I was struck by just how much, even though parts of the movie seem very exaggerated, um, on the surface at least, they're really not exaggerated that much when you really think about um, life. When human beings are put in certain situations that are completely out of their element because of the way that society has projected certain ideas onto them and shaped them in a certain way, that's when a lot of miscommunication happens. And that's another thing that you see often through Coen Brothers' work is the idea of miscommunication causing absolute chaos. And the moments of humor here do not feel inappropriate, they do not feel out of place because they are born out of authenticity. Kind of the way, you know, sometimes you're in a really high pressure situation or a really dark situation and then usually something random will happen that's very um, uncalled for but it can be kind of funny. Suddenly, a really dark moment, a really sad moment, a really scary moment is suddenly kind of bizarrely funny. It's odd, but it's how life is. You know, life is very unexpected, and life is not just one genre, as I always say. It is a blending of all sorts all the time. The Coen brothers really understand that, and they are packaging this film in a way that is very much, you know, uh, a pastiche, and yet somehow all of the elements, all of the genre elements blend seamlessly, which is really ironic when you think of pastiche filmmaking. Here just overall you have a sort of Americana, American sort of Western background, uh, a lot of noir elements as well, slasher elements providing kind of the framework for a very Shakespeare Shakespearean allegory. Having it shot in the Midwest just um, makes it so distinct and it's so amazing looking, uh, I think visually, that that Western landscape that is just covered in snow has an incredible effect to it. It, it has an, like an existential feel to it for me. A lonely car just driving into pure white, like a blanket of white and all that fog around it makes you feel uh, very small. It's it's eerie and those car lights kind of getting buried in the blizzard as they get smaller and smaller, it, as if it's being consumed by some sort of uh, a void. And also the fact that this is a violent movie. Blood is constantly being shed um, because of stupidity, because of cruelty, because of miscommunication as I've already said or what have you. And you know having all that blood against that fresh virgin snow is also very cinematic and, and dramatic. I have reviewed a few Coen Brothers movies on this channel. In the last few years I did a, 
No Country for Old Men, and then recently Blood Simple. Yes, both are similar in terms of content. Really, all three films are very, very similar in that sense. They are about small towns and uh, bloody murder. A lot of genre building and genre uh, reconstructing into something kind of new. Lots of long, tense sequences. But for me, I would say Fargo is more of an evolved work overall uh, compared to those other two films. Those films are not bad, certainly not. They're, they're very good in their own way. But ultimately they do feel more like exercises uh, in terms of tension building, and they don't have the same sort of depth that I think Fargo does. The ability to tap into the emotion and the humor and kind of the moral ideas all in a way that is really fleshed out um, to a much larger degree. Blood Simple is really wonderful, um, but ultimately it does feel like a first film, like a first dipping the toes in sort of uh, situation. A less developed version of what the Coens would eventually become, though very, very intriguing, certainly. And I also kind of feel the same way when it comes to No Country for Old Men, as amazing as aspects of it are, as amazing as the cinematography is, as amazing as some of the writing can be, the performances, especially, um, you know, the suspense building. All of that is really wonderful, and yet at a certain point, I struggle with the, the overall picture. I struggle with the thinness of certain things, the simplification of certain morals. It hints at a lot of the things that I think Fargo drives home. For me, one of the big keys to Fargo's success as a film, and most of the Coen brothers' greatest work, is having a very strong character at the center. A strong moral center, the glue that holds it together, and they have created what I consider to be maybe one of the great, not only one of the great uh, Coen brothers protagonists, but one of the great protagonists in uh, uh, American film. And that would be Marge Gunderson, the uh, pregnant police officer, and Frances McDormand, it was written for her, the part, and she plays it with just honesty, such sweetness, such tenderness, but she is strong. She's tough. She is honestly the biggest badass in the whole film for my money. But what makes her so wonderful, I think, is how evolved she is. She doesn't ask for rewards. She never asks for anything, really. She's pregnant throughout the film, and yet, you know, she barely mentions it. Every once in a while, of course, she does. Um, but she's doing twice the work as everybody else out there, and not once does she complain. And they could have easily written this character without the pregnancy angle, because, you know, it's not a significant plot point or anything like that. And yet, at the same time, somehow it feels so crucial. Because the idea of that baby is, is just purity. There's something about it, you know. She is, Marge Gunderson is at that symbol of, of hope, hope for the future, hope for the world. Proof that there is true goodness and true sensitivity, and you know that she will be the best mother that anyone could ask for. She is selfless in a greedy and pathetic world, and she's one of those people you just know there's not a, a, a careless bone in their body, a cruel bone in their body. She is maternal and very optimistic, kind, independent, and at times perhaps a little bit naive, and I think that does get the better of her at a certain point. And I think that's really important because her character certainly uh, does grow in a lot of ways that I think people don't always catch. I think because she has that kind of innocence about her and she's very gullible to a certain degree, you know, when she's taking on this case that maybe um, she isn't quite prepared for in the beginning, how dark it's going to be, she has to learn to navigate different waters. She has to learn to navigate these people that are very conniving and brutal and manipulative and evil. And she might be the kind of person who sees the good in everybody, but she can't really do that here at certain points. There is a scene that I absolutely adore, and I think it might be one of the best scenes for me in the entire movie, and it is her dinner date with Mike Makita. I think that scene, while it's not crucial in terms of the plot, and you could completely take it out of the entire movie, and it wouldn't really be lacking um, in a plot sort of sense, um, I think it highlights so much uh, emotionally what's going on under the surface. A good scene should always give the main character a little nugget to take with them. They should grow from the experience in some sort of way, and I think in this scene she she does. It's a very bizarre sort of scene. It feels uncomfortable and funny, where this pathetic man is just blatantly lying to her for sympathy, and she, she sort of believes him. And because she's empathetic, she doesn't look down on him for his desperation, but 
when she does learn that he lies to her, I think that's when it changes her a little bit. It makes her realize that people are very complicated and certain people cannot be trusted and that this man here is not really that different from Jerry Lundegaard. Both are pathetic, both are spineless and afraid to face the truth and af afraid to uh, face their mistakes. So they try to take the easy way out. And of course that leads to um, complete failure. Of course, Jerry's situation is to a much greater degree, but while people may see that other scene with Mike Makita as out of place, I see it as enhancing the entire film in such a strong way. And that is the point when Marge really realizes what Jerry Lundegaard is. He is a liar. And from there, she can solve the case as Steve Buscemi and William H. Macy's characters are just seeking deeper and deeper into this shitstorm they've created. And yet Marge is the one that comes out on top. In the scene at the end, one of her final scenes where she is in the car, uh, with this violent uh, psychopath is perhaps one of the great scenes in all of Coen Brothers lore. It brings tears to my eyes every time. It is absolutely pure and beautiful. This woman who, you know, might be innocent in some ways does have great wisdom. And what she's saying here might be dismissed as, as cliche or uninteresting by the person sitting in the car with her, but she is right. She's living a life that is much more true and honest and happier than most people. She lives simply and she just doesn't understand how there could be so much cruelty, so much unnecessary pain in this world when it's such a beautiful gift to be alive. To her, every day is beautiful and you can make the most of it. And yes, it might be something very typical, but that's something a character like that would say and she really means it. And I think when you say something with conviction, it matters. This movie really could have ended on a, a snarky note, on a very cynical note with some sort of sardonic wit to be controversial or shocking or more interesting. But I think all of those efforts would be um, very superficial. This works because the core of it is pain and emptiness. And yet still there is that balance of love and hope. And so it's just a, a weird combination of, of bittersweetness. The confidence that these two guys have and their intuitiveness as creators, as collaborators is an astoundingly rare thing. But I'm glad that we have them. Even if a scene is not crucial, even if it seems out of place, look a little bit closer and it means something. If a character may not be crucial on paper in terms of plot, they somehow are crucial in some form. The performances all around are brilliant, not just Frances McDormand, but um, William H. Macy, Steve Buscemi, as I said, and so many more. If you haven't seen it, you should. It's really, really wonderful. And this is kind of the perfect time, the kind of winter, kind of cold. It is, like I said, one of the best Coen Brothers movies ever. So if you like the Coen Brothers, no excuse. And that is my review. Thank you guys so much for watching. Here are my Patreon supporters. Thank you guys so much for your support. Also, I'm doing the art thing. I am an artist and I do commission portraits and I sell prints on my website, deepfocuslens.com. You can look there, check the shop if you're interested. Shoot me an email, certainly, if you want a commission, I'm happy to work with you. And beyond that, all of my social media information is below. You can watch more videos here and you can subscribe if you'd like. Catch you next time.